Uh, welcome, everyone. So this is Chrome OS Graphics 1 on 1, right? The goal is not to go into details, but the goal is to introduce uh, the basics of the Chrome OS Graphics stack. Uh, my name is Stefan. I work on Chrome OS Graphics, incidentally. So it's a good fit, I guess. Uh, and I've been here for a while. And so we're going to, in this presentation, try to focus on some use cases and some uh, like patterns that can be useful as a basis to understand how Chrome OS uh, graphics stack functions. So first of all, here's a quick overview of uh, Chrome OS uh, desktop. And here we have multiple uh, windows, as you can see. On top, we have a web-based, HTML-based uh, window. Uh, but underneath it, we have other components. We have uh, Arc++ window with the Play Store, right? And underneath it, we have a native Linux application, gedit, uh, running, all of this running on Chrome OS. And as you can imagine, all these things are pretty different. And I think the goal here is to actually try to figure out like, how do they function together? How do we make sure they work, etc. So uh, let's start with the first one sentence, super high level description of what's happening. Um, Chrome OS graphics stack really has two halves. One is user space. Uh, Chrome running in user space as the big application. And it sits on a kernel API called DRM, uh, which basically provides services in terms of display and graphics. Okay, So the Linux kernel provides the basic services at the graphics uh, level, and Chrome exploits these to build the interface we, we saw earlier. So if we look at it in terms of a little bit of a schematic here, um, those three uh, main windows we were looking at earlier, uh, one of them is a renderer. Right? So one of them is a web-based renderer, so it sits here. One of them was this Arc++ store, right? so that's this stack. And one of them is the Linux application, which uses what we call Crustini, which is basically our Linux virtual machines on top of Chrome OS. Okay? Um, to be able to display those applications together, we have a few tricks up our sleeve. Um, for native applications, it's pretty simple. right? It works basically the same way uh, as you know, normal uh, Chrome tabs, you would. Uh, we have renderer processes that talk to Chrome. We'll go into more detail into exactly how this is done, right? For external applications like Arc++ or Crustini applications, right? We will uh, actually use a um, mechanism called Exo, Exosphere, which takes foreign buffers from native applications and puts them onto the screen as part of all the other windows, so everything that gets produced this way can go, uh, you see, in a single place. So it's kind of a hint uh, in this picture, right? We see things coming together into the middle here. This is what's happening. We're gathering all the image together, and we try to produce content. OK? So before we go into too much detail into how exactly all of this works, I'm going to give a quick run, a quick introduction on all of these layers here. And we're going to start from the bottom from the hardware, and I will say, look, this can do this, this does this, this does this. And then once we have all the PCs, we will look at some use cases and scenario, how they line up, okay? So uh, let's start with the first piece, the hardware. What's in the box there? Uh, graphics hardware, actually, there are many things in this box, right? It's not just a GPU, 3D engine. It's not just a display engine. It's many things. So the first piece that's important to think about is what we call a 3D engine. This is what you probably all know as like uh, direct, DirectX, direct, DirectX 12 type of implementation, OpenGL, Vulkan, right? all that stuff, that good stuff, the 3D. Uh, this is done there. Uh, then we have another piece called the display engine. Uh, so the first piece takes the commands, right? those high level rendering commands, and produces buffers of pixels out of them. The display engine takes buffers of pixels, sends them on the wire to get displayed on the screen. right? So you have two engines that work together to, one, produce images, and two, show them on the screen. Uh, the last engine, which we're not going to talk about today because it's only half hour, uh, is the video engine, which is similar to the 3D engine in that it produces buffers, but instead of producing like buffers based on like a stream of rendering commands, it produces buffers based on an encoded video. Think about stuff like VP8, VP9 videos, H.264 videos, right? You play YouTube. There's a little piece of hardware that knows how to decode this YouTube stream into a picture, and then that picture can go to the display engine and get shown on the screen. So that's the basics. So what's above uh, the hardware layer? Above our hardware layer, we have, like I said, the kernel side, the DRM, uh, 
uh, not to be confused with digital right management. Uh, it's direct rendering manager. It's a, the name of the kernel module in Linux, okay? Um, so that sits on top of the hardware. It, it talks to it, it programs it, right? And uh, basically through it, we can control the GPU and the display and say, hey, do this now, do that now. Uh, two interesting bits of functionality that exist in there. Uh, one is uh, through uh, the atomic updates, we enable what we call overlays, which is a mechanism by which multiple layers in a display engine can get uh, displayed at the same time. This is useful if, for example, you want to have multiple buffers that come in and not have to copy all them into a single buffer. But instead, we display all of these buffers transparently using the display hardware functionality of like, this one goes here, that one goes there, right? Think about one window, one other window, these are two buffers, that's essentially what this can do. And so we have a functionality called atomic display, which says, I want to set in an atomic way this set of overlays, this set of buffers on the, onto the screen. Uh, the other one, a very powerful piece of functionality we have is buffer sharing. So this is about taking a buffer from, let's say, the 3D engine right, that produces 3D content and sharing it to another piece of the driver, let's say the display part of the driver, or sharing it between the process and another process. Right? So we have this capability of taking a buffer and without making a copy along the way, telling to another process, here's my buffer, you can use it or you can produce it and I will reuse it later, right? And so this is done, this is called DMA buff, and this is basically a file descriptor. So this little file descriptor, we can pass it around over like a socket, right? And we can tell the other process, hey, you can have this buffer, I'm sending it to you, it's yours. And that way we can have zero copy buffer sharing between basically all the pieces of the stack that we saw earlier, okay? So these are the two big mechanisms that are fundamental in all, in, in, exact, in the whole of the Chrome OS graphics stack. Um, one piece that's also interesting is our GPU memory allocator, uh, mini GBM. Uh, it's basically a way to solve the buffer format problem. Uh, this is a library that takes a request. For example, I want to allocate a buffer that has these properties. I want this buffer to be displayable. I want this buffer to be uh, renderable by my GPU. And I want this buffer to have a dimensions of 1024 by 768. <coughs> and so we give all those constraints to MiniGBM and say, give me back a buffer, and it does. Okay, here's your allocation. Uh, why is this abstracted? Because different GPUs have different requirements. For example, in terms of pitch, in, in terms of internal formats, in, in even in terms of what they can or cannot do. Sometimes this will fail, right? So we have all these things to, to take into account. Um, so, we abstract that, and one of the things that can be done, you remember I said in a previous slide, we can exchange those buffers, right, using DMA buffs. One of the things we can do once we've allocated something is say, give me a file descriptor from a DMA buff out of this, and I'm gonna share it with another process, okay? And so this is what we say here, yeah, support buffer sharing, right? And so it carries a bit of metadata, right? Uh, modifiers, fertiling, et cetera. Uh, but for most intents and purposes, this can be hidden, right? We can ignore that behind the scenes all this stuff happened. The library is hiding it for us. Uh, then on top of it, uh, well, not on top, aside on the side of that, we have all the 3D drivers. So here we're talking about GLES, Vulkan, right? This is the stuff that takes those high-level rendering commands, produces, uh, draws triangles out of them and produces those buffers of, uh, of rendering that we know. Uh, one interesting thing in the Chrome OS is that we have a special process called the GPU process, or now it's been renamed to the Viz process, which basically can be a marshaller and can be like a proxy for all of the GPU access in Chrome OS. And by this, I mean any other process like the renderer, et cetera, right, that want to use the GPU, do not do it directly. They will do it through that GPU or Viz process, right? So I'm gonna use both GPU and Viz name because it's in the middle of transition and myself, I'm confused about it, uh, but uh, that's the same thing. Uh, what, what's interesting there is that we can actually recover. So if there's a driver crash, for, for example, a driver side crash, uh, this process is made to be restarted. Like it's, we are resilient in the whole stack and we can say, oh, it crashed. You will see uh, probably the screen like freeze or blink for a second and then it will restart. And usually that means it's a GPU process crash. Uh, if you wanna play with it, you can actually go in your uh, process manager in Chrome OS and find a GPU process, kill it, you will see it comes back, uh, but you will have a blink. So they, that's one thing that's kind of funny. In terms of 
tests, we have to pass the GPU integration tests right, for these drivers on Chrome OS, uh, for the Chrome side. Now, things function, you remember I said we have three stacks, right? the web stack, the Android stack, and the Linux virtual machine stack. For the Android stack, things function differently. The Android applications do have direct access to these drivers as well, just like the Chrome GP process or Chrome Vis process. Um, and to satisfy the Android uh, requirements, we have to pass a, uh, some tests, basically. Uh, DQP and CTS, the Android conformance tests, right? Uh, to be qualified as an Android uh, implementation. So that's also ensuring uh, the quality uh, of our uh, code here. And finally, the, last, the third and the last uh, type of application that we run are our uh, Linux virtual machine apps, right? Uh, this one is full on, full on virtualization. And so we have an extra layer that actually virtualizes the graphics and runs on top of the host implementation of the GPU driver. Again, we will go into more details into how exactly this functions in a minute. So let's go one layer higher in the stack. We start to be inside of Chrome at this point with a layer called Ozone. Ozone is an abstraction layer in Chrome and its purpose is just to abstract the platform as in uh, all the specifics of how you make windows, how you, you know, allocate the graphics buffer, how you display things on the screen, screen all of that, it's abstracted by this layer called Ozone. Uh, of course, because it's an abstraction, it supports many possible uh, backends, right? Uh, so it's not just Chrome OS. Uh, other backends include like just working on Linux, uh, working on Wayland. Uh, there's a Chromecast backend, right? If you run Chromecast, uh, there's a special Ozone Chromecast backend that runs only on Chromecast. And this is how Chrome runs on this platform. Um, and so Ozone is hiding all of these details from the high levels, implement those primitives that we talked about. And like I said earlier, you know, we have those hardware overlays, right? Those uh, layers we can use to have multiple windows together at the display level. It also exposes that to the higher layer. So what's on top of that? On top of that, we have a Chrome display, Chrome compositor or Chrome display compositor. Uh, initially, this was written to uh, support one tab. So you would have multiple elements inside of a web page, and we would have to layer them on top of each other. Uh, and so the initial vision for this compositor was to say, well, all these elements needs to be squashed together to produce that picture. So that's what this does. The compositor basically takes a set of pictures and squashes them. Over time, it has grown. So that was the initial, initial design right, to support that use case. Uh, over time, it grew. Uh, in Chrome OS in particular, it supports the UI compositing, which means our user interface, our window bar, window titles, our menus, our shelves, etc. all of this sits also on top of that same display compositor. And when we added uh, Play Store Android support to, to Chrome OS, what happened is that we added a third component on top of that same compositor, Exosphere, right? Uh, which lets us import buffers out of those applications, native applications. And you know, display them as part of the normal flow of compositing. Quickly, the Chrome compositor does have support for a bunch of effects, right? So it, it, when you see a blur effect implemented at the UI level or used at the UI level, it is actually implemented in the compositor. Same thing for rounded corners, color transformations, etc. It supports all those basic effects, right? But it doesn't know, for example, what the window bar is or what the shelf is at all. It only knows, okay, I can give you rounded corners around that rectangle. That's what I can do. The thing that does understand those uh, semantics, like it's a window bar, et cetera, is the Chrome OS UI. So the Chrome OS UI uses those, these functionalities we talked about, right? The, uh, the blur, the rounded corners, the, you know, all those layer support, and lets us build a UI on top of it. Uh, this UI is the Aura shell, or we call it Ash, right? Uh, which is basically in charge of giving your window a frame of giving your window a shadow, right? Uh, displaying a launcher at the bottom, right? And it does so, right, on top of all this functionality we talked about. Now, if we go one to the side after the UI, right? So we talked about Exosphere, which is the capability to import those foreign applications uh, windows into our compositor. All these extra clients can send their buffers over for us and we can integrate it into the display. How does that work? Uh, we use the protocol called Wayland, uh, which is basically a Linux standard for display. Uh, Exosphere is essentially a Wayland server, and the clients are just Wayland clients, and they send the buffers over. And so this is pretty standard. We had to modify the protocol a little bit to support some of the functionality 
we cared about but wasn't there. Uh, for example, we're talking about adding window frames, doing some scaling, etc. But it, nothing too big. And yeah, Exosphere, like we saw in like four slides ago, right? It's a client of the display compositor, just like all the other components. Uh, and again, we'll see in more detail later how Exo or Exosphere is used to display an Android app or to display a Linux application. So Arc++, aka Play Store support, aka Android support in Chrome OS. It lets us run those Android applications that we saw at the very beginning on top of Chrome OS uh, using native performance. Now, one of the things is that this actually runs a full uh, Android system, right? And we had to re-implement all the platform-specific components in a Chrome OS-specific way to make Arc++ function. So that includes graphics. Uh, for graphics, what does that mean? Well, there's a buffer allocator called Graloc, right? Which is similar to our mini GBM allocator, but different because it's a different platform. So we implemented this on top of mini GBM. Uh, in terms of drivers, we are able to use the same almost drivers minus some little integration. Uh, so that's actually quite straightforward. In terms of how do you display windows, like we said earlier, we have to hook all our machinery up to EXO, right? And so in HWC means hardware composer. Right? These are the same thing. Uh, we have a hardware composer, which is a platform specific component implementation that instead of doing on any normal Android platform, you would do that. You would, hardware composer would take those windows from Android, put them together, it would be the main compositor basically, and show them on the screen. In Chrome OS, we cannot do that because of course we have to pass them to Chrome. So our hardware composer implementation just passes things down to Chrome for further display. Um, one last one that we have is Krasny, like I said, our Linux virtual machine application support. Um, this one uses a full-on virtual machine, right? So there's actually a guest kernel running with a whole uh, Linux system running inside of the image. Um, and because of that, we do not have direct access to the GPU or to any graphics uh, for that matter. So we have indirect access. What does that mean? That means that we have to have some kind of broker in the middle that will marshal commands in the guest and demarshal them on the host right, to actually execute them. This thing is called Virgil, uh, and it basically implements uh, 3D. And then we have a daemon called Sommelier, which basically delegates the presentation to Chrome uh, in a very similar way to what our hardware composer does uh, on the Android side of things. So these were all the components. Uh, now let's put them together and see when I have a web page and something happens on the page, how does that get to my screen? Right? We, we have seen all the components, but how do they flow, right? So here's a hopefully simple diagram of uh, how this lines up, right? So this is an HTML page. So each tab, as you might know in Chrome, are runs in its own process, right? The renderer processes, they're called. So we have HTML and JavaScript running inside this tab. Um, we have the Blink, which is our, you know, web engine, uh, parses the DOM and produces all those GPU rasterization commands, right? So we talked about how the GPU can turn high-level drawing commands into buffers of pixels. This is why we're trying to do that. Produces those commands, but doesn't execute them. Just produces them and passes them here to the GPU or Viz process, which will actually run them on top of the GPU, so on top of real graphics hardware for us. Um, when that's done, well, this is going to go through the host OpenGLES stack to the kernel, to the hardware, and back. When that is done, we can produce a new frame, and we can send that frame to the compositor Right? which will then take that frame and merge it with all the other windows that we have, squash them together, call the ozone layer, and that's the play on word right here, uh, call the ozone layer uh, to ask for a display to show it on the screen, which will go to the kernel and affect it. Okay? So in linear terms, let's put this in a little more linear terms. We start with our web document triggers a paint right, in Blink. That triggers the rasterization, right, which will produce those list of commands. Then the rasterization happens, uh, and that triggers a new frame and the display compositor level. Okay, so that at that time we're in the GPU or Viz process. Then the display compositor squashes all those images and puts them together, right, to produce a scan out buffer. And then we decide, oh, now we can display that buffer, right, because it's ready. So we talk to Ozone, please start displaying. And then the kernel driver takes that command and programs the hardware to start displaying it, okay? 
and then the pixels show up on the screen, everybody's happy, we see our image. Uh, how does that look for an Android application? Uh, for an Android application, it's a little bit different. We have the full Android stack here running. We have the Android application, same thing, produces its own private buffer here. Uh, but when it's done, it passes it to the composer of Android, which is Surface Slinger. When that receives the frames, it will give this to the hardware composer. The hardware composer that we have will just pass things over across outside of the Android system to Chrome itself. And then basically we use the same compositing stack we talked about uh, in the previous slide, okay? So what does that look like? Um, we scroll in the Play Store application. We have a, a new frame that gets produced because we scroll or using OpenGL, for example, or using CPU, both can work. Uh, Surface Flinger tells Hardware Composer, hey, look, this is the new frame. Can you do something with it? Hardware Composer will pass the frame over to Chrome. And then uh, Exosphere takes this buffer and can put it as part of the, uh, well, can generate a new display uh, compositor frame. Then the display composite in this case hits an overlay because we see that maybe the buffer, the other buffers have not changed. So we can reuse that overlay and not have to do full compositing. So this is very cheap. So we're happy. So we go to us on the airman and say, please change that overlay and show the new buffer of this application. And then the kernel programs the hardware to do that. And we see it on the screen, it's magical. The Linux application to screen flow is super similar to the Android flow, except that we have a bigger box here that also has its own private kernel. But you see the same mechanism here happens. Linux application goes through our virtualized OpenGL stack, which executes rendering command by plumbing this all the way down outside the VM. We come back with a buffer. The buffer is passed to Wayland through Sommelier and goes to Exo, and basic to X Wayland and Sommelier, sorry, and goes through Exo. And basically, we can, from that part on, is exactly the same thing as an R++ uh, buffer. So in linear terms again, what does that look like? Well, we type some characters in gedit. Uh, GTK3 will trigger some rasterization, produce a new frame. If we're CPU-based rendering, we will copy that contents into a DMA buff that then gets passed to EXO, right? Again, just like other... Uh, at that point, it's exactly similar to our Android applications. Right? It's a buffer that comes into EXO. And okay, you already know the drill. We produce a new display frame. We find that we can use an overlay. We go to a DRM. And of course, uh, the kernel driver starts scanning out the buffer, blah, blah, and it, goes, it shows up on the screen. And again, we're happy. Uh, so that's for the display case. I have one more case that's interesting before we wrap up, is what happens when you plug in a display, uh, which is, graphics display, you know, I, I do both, so I can talk about both. Uh, so this one is kind of funny. We have a monitor that gets plugged in. The hardware will generate an event that goes up to the kernel. Ozone will pick up that event. And we go through a piece of code called display configurator that has all the logic to decide based on this monitor. At that point, right, nothing has happened to the monitor. Monitor is still black. At that point, there's this logic that was like, oh, what is this monitor type? What video mode should I pick? What's the refresh rate that I should pick, et cetera? Should I be in mirror mode, in extended mode? So here, these are the brains that make that decision. When this makes that decision, it affects it. They say, okay, Ozone DRM, please program the monitor with 1024 by 768, I don't know, 60 hertz, basic resolution. Goes to the kernel that actually affects the hardware. Uh, there's a little extra arrow because we tell the Chrome OS UI, look, we have a whole new display that just came in. Please take care of it, put a UI on it, et cetera, right? So it's a little arrow, but there's a lot of work that will happen down the line. But I think the, the gist of it is we go through display configurator first. Uh, so again, in linear term, what does that mean? Uh, we plug the monitor, right? There's a hardware event. The kernel picks up that event. Uh, we consume that event in the ozone layer. The configurator decides that, oh, I want this mode for my display. Ozone, you know, asks the kernel, hey, can you please set this mode that the configurator decided? And then the kernel configures it. And we see pixel on the screen, everybody's happy. 